And now it's time for learning more about our lives as students, our body as humans, and our future as happy, healthy people. The APU and AUV Podcast Network presents the Student Health and Happiness Podcast with your host, Dr. Russell Freeman. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Student Health and Happiness Program. I'm Russell Freeman. I'm a professor at American University in Vietnam, and I teach health science and martial arts philosophy. And our subject today is to answer the question, what is the best career for me? This is the biggest question that's on people's mind when they're in the university environment. And of course, we started thinking about this when we were younger. And when I was eight, I wanted to be an astronaut. And As I started to age, of course, my idea of the best career for me changed depending on what people told me, what I saw, the way the world was, and whatever mood I was in. But I'd like to go back a little bit farther in terms of how we think about our future when we're making decisions today that are going to affect our careers. So today in our studio, we're very fortunate to have Mr. Michael Hayes, who is our school counselor and extremely experienced in doing career counseling for various age groups, especially in high school and university. So welcome, Michael. Thank you. It's good to be here. Great. So before we get started, um, I'd just like to provide a little introduction and define some terms. Let's talk about the question about who we are and what we do And if somebody asks you, tell me about yourself, how quickly does what you do, in other words, how quickly does what your work enter into the answer about who are you, what do you do, tell me about yourself? For most people, their job becomes their identity, part of the who and what they are. Your image, both to others and to yourself, They're very closely tied to your job. Maybe you're proud, excited, or disappointed and bored, but you definitely are something, and it's related to the work that you do. So let's first define some terms. Who am I? This is a question that can be answered with anything from your name to a long explanation of your traits as a person, or your values, your hopes, your dreams. Really, anything that describes or defines you as a person could be the answer to who am I. What I, what I am or what am I refers to what kind of person I am in terms of one's beliefs and core values. But it's important and has implications for your well-being and also your future direction. What I am refers to me externally, like my job, my responsibility to the community, my grandfather's caregiver that defines what you are. Who I am, though, is more an internal sense. My interest, my traits, my personality, how I think about others, that's who I am. So if we can keep those things in mind, perhaps we'll be able to come to a better understanding in our conversation today. Now, another question that people are confused about is whether or not they're supposed to love their work. So let me ask you, Michael, Do you think that most working people here enjoy uh, and are really, say, into their work? or And and how does it compare in Vietnam to other countries like the United States, Australia, Japan, Korea? Well, certainly folks that are fortunate enough to love their work or have found their true meaning um, through their, their work are the most fortunate ones of all. Those are the folks that can get out of bed in the morning and hit the ground running and show up and be on time and be prepared for whatever the day is going to bring them. And those those folks that are really enthusiastic um, about what they're doing in life to create life for those around them are really blessed. But there's a, a, a larger population, I suspect, that are just sort of going through the motions and paying the bills and probably quite disenfranchised from their whole aspirational vision for what they wanted to be in life. And, and those folks are probably, you know, 
totally underemployed or, you know, just not very happy in what they're doing for a variety of reasons. But the folks that are passionate and enjoying themselves and having fun, um, there's nothing that says work can't be fun. I try to make fun a big part of my day at work. I see. And do most employees in the world, do you think, I mean, you've worked all over the world and you've, you've met people, your colleagues, as well as people you've counseled. Do you find that most people in the world are, are engaged in their work? Are, uh, do they rely on the culture of the office for their benefits or do they find true benefit in the work? In other words, are most people who are employed these days are they into the work or are they into the working? Meaning the working is the job to make the money, but the work is the art of what you're doing, the expression of who you are that comes out in the job that you do. Well, that's a great question. I, again, I think the data, you know, it depends on whose data you're looking at. And I would go back to the whole concept of those folks that have found their bliss that have found their, their true get go in life. Um, as an example, I've got friends that were, have worked in the ski industry for 40 years and that's all they know. That's what they, that's what they truly enjoy. It's not for everyone, but they keep at it. Um, you know, it's like anyone that's fortunate enough to really find their, their calling. Um, those are the folks that you want to spend time with and, you know, it's not about just paying the bills. It's about contributing and giving back to people around you and, and your society. You used a very interesting expression. You said a calling. And I, I, that to me um, says many things, that, that word, a calling when it comes to business. It's, the word for that is a vocation. Usually if somebody has a, a natural ability, they at seven years old, they were a brilliant piano player, for example, or mm -hmm. they're a great scientist or a mathematical genius or can play chess and beat the machines. Right. There are there are those people in the world that are born to be whatever they're going to end up being. They were just made to do that. Right. I always wished I was one of those and always tried through experimenting different things, both intellectually and physically, to find out if I had a calling for anything. And I didn't. <laughs> so I had a lot of, I really had a lot of uh, learning experience to go through before I figured out where my passion was because it wasn't tied to my natural ability. My natural ability came out when I had passion for something and I did it a thousand times. Right, right. I didn't have that, that window that was already open for me because I had a family business to go into or because all of my family were musicians and I was born with that gift. I, I didn't have that. I was just a normal kid that wanted to have a job that I, I liked, but a life that, you know, was supported by my job, not the other way around. And then the other aspect that came in for me was my parents. Sure. Yeah. Big so, influences on everyone's career choice. So I'd like to know because I'm an, I'm American and so are you, and we have certain parental protocols, I guess you'd call them, things that most parents do with most kids to help them get into school and survive and learn how to be a happy person and pick the right career. But some parents are very controlling, and they tell the kids what kind of adult they're going to be and how they're going to do it. And it may be for bragging rights, or it may be because they they really have the the best thing in mind for their kids, although it doesn't feel like that to the kid. Uh, so have you found that parenting has a different, bigger, smaller, or different effect here in Vietnam or in other countries than in Western countries? Well, certainly in Vietnam, uh, there's the whole concept of, you know, working in a career field that has high esteemed value, such as a doctor, lawyer, engineer. Um, but it's, it's pretty similar around the world, but I think in, in this part of the world, particularly there's, um, 
more emphasis on those sort of career fields or choices. Whereas uh, folks like yourself and myself, uh, being from the U.S., we we were I was given certainly a lot more latitude in my choice making. Um, I was not really hindered in any way, other than my own motivation. Um, and so I chose to do things that I found were motivating to me, but they weren't always things I'm sure my parents were really excited about. Um, but I've, I've managed. And I think the bigger thing for most students is, you know, sort of coming to grips with your parental expectations and also maybe your peers and what they're doing and how they're doing it and where they're going. And then coming to the realization that each of us have a gift for contributing to our community and our societies. And it, t- it takes a while to sort of process and figure out where it is you want to be, you know, in that work life. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I see what you're saying now. There's, you know, there's parents that tell you, I just want you to be happy, find something that you love and be a good person. There are parents that are going to tell you, you're going to be a lawyer. Right, that right. kind of thing, and yep. and this is where if we get back to our definitions from the beginning of our talk today about the who and what we are, this is where this conflict becomes um, very important because what you are is you're your for example in your case you're your father's son right and right. as your father's son you have a responsibility to do what he tells you to do and to fulfill his expectations of you so that's the what of who you are in this situation. The who of who you are is you don't love science. You love reading. You love travel. You love cooking. You don't love any of the things that he wants you to do for the rest of right. your life. Right. This is a conflict. So Very who, big conflict. Who yeah. do you choose? Do you choose pleasing mom and dad or do you choose being true to yourself? Now, this was never a choice before in most cultures. People right. were born into either the status level, the locale, or whatever condition, whether it was poverty, success, farming, or trade, they were born into that situation. Yep. There's a lot more freedom and, nowadays. And there really wasn't a question of, I, I think I'd rather be a lawyer than a doctor. That, that didn't come up right. for most people. But now, it's a much different situation. Very big, and very big choices Facilitated even more so by the internet, by yep. international yeah. schools, all the and TV and all, yep. all this other, all this other thing. So uh, how does somebody resolve, what's the math for doing the, con, for, for resolving the conflict between who and what when you're making a career decision? Well, I, I tell a lot of my students, you know, let's just get to college because, uh, again, the data supports those that uh, get a college degree. They tend to have a higher level of satisfaction in life. They're going to make a little more money in the long run. Let's just get there. W- university experiences will open up a lot more opportunities to those who choose to attend. It's not for everyone. There are other options but it's a good option for a lot of people. And, you know, your parents may want you to be a lawyer, but let's just get you to university because by three or four years from now, the, the landscape's going to change dramatically and there'll be more information. You'll be a different person in three or four years, but let's just transition away from high school and get into a university environment somewhere where you're content and happy and thriving and exposed to a lot more variety of ideas and how life might be. And then you'll have to sort it out. So for those, for those of the most, most of us that really don't know when we go into university, where we want to end up, what kind of tool do I want to make this school experience? Mm. It sounds like the most valuable thing that you're going to get out of the university experience is learning about yourself. Absolutely, and, yeah. And trying and failing yep. and seeing what you love yep. and, and learning about new things and taking risks and seeing really what your limits are that are probably much different than you thought they were. For sure, And, and, yeah. and then so really when, what I hear you saying is it, you may want to wait until you're done with university. 
before you make a career decision? A lot of students do, um, but a lot of universities also provide internship opportunities. A lot of students have to work while they're in university. Um, you know, so there's a lot of opportunities to sort of pick and choose. If you're fortunate not to have to work and just go to school, you can uh, be exposed to so much information out there, so many different things. Um, This is a great time to be alive as a college student. Um, It's just a matter of, you know, sort of figuring out what works for me and what I really don't want to do in the future. So if I was a student and came to you for advice, is that what you would tell me? Would that be our first basic conversation that what you just said? Pretty much. My, my suggestion would be let's just get from where we are today at APU and then make that transi- transition to AUV or another college or university environment and know that as you gather more information and you, you walk a few more miles into your own life, you're going to gather the lessons that you need to figure out what it is you really want to do. Um, at 17 or 18, no one has it really figured out. You know, if you can figure it out by your mid twenties or thirties, good for you. Yeah. It was my late twenties for me. So in your experience, um, how, how do most students choose their careers? We, we do a lot of um, testing here at APU. Um, we, we provide students with opportunities to take um, work inventories or ACT and College Board provide opportunities to do surveys and gather more information around feelings or um, connecting to certain things that students might be good at if they're organized or they play an instrument or they have an aptitude for math or an aptitude for science. It'll help sort of guide a student in one direction. doesn't mean they're going to end up on a particular path to being a a PhD in biology or anything, but it's going to pull them in a direction and give them a starting point And that's all we really want to do is help them feel secure in themselves where they have good decision-making skills and hopefully they'll use those in their own life when it comes to their career. I'm curious what you have come to expect your students to, um, how can I put this? What do most students expect in the short, medium, and long terms of their career? Do they expect to get out of school and have a, a good job, a management job right away? Are they realistic about how you really become successful in, in something? Well, you know, each student's pretty unique, and, and they're going to have – some students are going to have this idea of where they want to go, and and good for them – I've worked with a lot of young people who have said, you know, I want to go work for Goldman Sachs or I want to go be a doctor or I want to be a chemical engineer somewhere. And then a lot of students have just said, I just, I know I want to go to school. I know I want to go to university. My parents want me to go. I don't know what I want to be. And it's like, that's fine. We're going to work with wherever you are to get you to the next step so that you're confident and you're, you're learning and you're growing as a human being and, those decisions, you know, will come to you with more time. One of the things that I, I believe to be true is that no matter who you're talking about or what their dream is, their goal is to be successful at it. Oh, I think we all want to be successful. So yeah. I, I want to define that mm. term because depending on how you define success, that is going to determine your expectations and your trajectory and any decision that you make. So how do most students define success and how do you define it? Is it any different? Well, uh, you know, when I talk to students in group settings, one of the things I talk a lot about is money. You know, obviously you've got to have money. Um, Personally, when I got into the profession I'm in now, my thought process was more focused on I wanted my summers off. I wanted to go climbing mountains in the summertime. You made a lifestyle decision. I, I made a lifestyle decision. 
Um, but a lot of our students uh, that I've encountered over the years, they're more focused on, you know, things, and that's all good and fine. Um, and so you have to help them understand that, okay, if you want a, a boat, a yacht, if you want a helicopter, if you want a pilot's license, if you want a Porsche, you're going to have to have some some money to go with that. And so you've got to pick a profession that's going to allow you to do that. And, you know, the more money you are seeking to get to have that lifestyle, the harder you're going to work. How does someone, how does a student make a transition from dreaming about success to actually achieving it through their career choice? Wow. You know, uh, that's a great question. I, I've seen students who have <clears throat> um, invested in the stock market. I've known students that have uh, done TikTok and YouTube videos, um, and they've, they've really started a process where they're becoming very um, self-supporting through their own efforts. And I've also known students that have had businesses on the side and then, you know, they didn't go to college and they kept growing their business and they were hugely successful. Um, so it really comes down to individual strengths and preferences, individual visions for their own personal future and where they want to go. Do most students have a sense of uh, evolving as the world evolves with their career or do they see it as a snapshot as they're preparing today for what the snapshot of the career looks like now. And by the time six years later, where they're actually in the middle of it, the career has changed, the world has changed, and they have changed. Do they factor those things into the mathematics of career choice? We talk a lot about being a lifelong learner and not being afraid to take on new information and, and figure out if it's a good fit for you and adapting to the current circumstances. Because as we've seen with the Internet, Things change very, very rapidly. Um, you can't just say, I'm going to do a, a specific thing today with, and then stop learning about it. There's very few careers that allow you to just stop. You have to continue to evolve and grow and stay curious about how to improve yourself and how to be um, you know, more of who you really envision yourself being in the future. Uh, I've always used, um, I, I'm not a counselor, I don't have the experience that you have, but in, in my own situation and when I have talked to young people about this, I, I, I basically div divide my decision making of career choice into seven, seven parts. And the first one is the most obvious and easiest choice. Do something you love, something you have passion about. And this is philosophically, you know, we've always heard, you know, if you have passion for your work, you'll never work a day in your life kind of thing. Sure. Yeah. So the, the really lucky ones are the ones that have passion and talent together. The second level would be you're talented and you have ability and it's easy for you. You may not love it, but you're really good at it. Right. right. The third is it's something that you can do and it's okay. It's acceptable. It's sufficient. The third is I don't know how to do it, but I can learn it, and it's desirable. It's something I'd really like to do, okay. and I can learn how to do it. Yep. The one below that is I can do it, but I don't like it. And, yeah. and then the one is that I can learn it, but I still, but I don't like it. <laughs> and right. the, the other one, the last one is there's no options. I got to do what I got to do. Right, and, and that's kind of the life cycle for most human beings is we generally start at the bottom of that right. list. And we, if we're fortunate enough, we'll work our way through until we find that thing that really makes us whole and makes us complete mm -hmm. and allows us to be blissful and in the moment where money's great, I love it, I want it more than I can imagine, but I, I like doing whatever it is I'm doing, whether it's running a soundboard or being a counselor or you know, adjusting someone's back as a chiropractor. So I guess we agree that the combination of passion and productivity are the ideal situation. And that's really what people should aim for as, as high as they can get on that scale. I, I would encourage that for sure, because if you're using your, your brain as opposed to your brawn, 
your brain, as we all know, is going to outlast any brawn and, uh, or in the long run. And certainly if you keep your brain sharp and you stay healthy, you know, your level for expansion and creativity is just going to continue to grow as we age. And so it's going to, you know, serve you best in the long run. So maybe you need to, in your mind, when you're making a choice now, project what are you going to be like when you're 40? What are you going to be like when you're 60? And will you be able to evolve or will this will this career be able to evolve to keep you on the right track to, to have yeah, a that, passionate that, that's life? That's the kind of question for someone who's maybe in their 30s. But when we're talking with students, uh, they're much more grounded in, you know, the immediacy of what's going to happen like next year. You know? How did you do it, Michael? Tell us about how you ended up in this chair. Um, you know, I was very fortunate. I... Um, I went to college and university and then I worked for a number of years for a large company and um, had a certain level of success. And then I took a right hand turn and became a ski bum and loved skiing and teaching kids how to ski. But I always had this dream of going to graduate school and that happened. And I just happened to get into education and my advisor said, well, you don't really want to be a history teacher. You want to be a guidance counselor. And he was right. And it's been a great opportunity for me. I've enjoyed everything I've done um, over the years. I've traveled the world. I've interacted with families and students uh, in more countries than I can imagine. And, you know, I've been truly blessed. And I, I would say that if you have that sense of gratitude for the things that come into your life, Whatever career you have uh, will be much easier, but if you can forge a gratitude and a passion for what you're doing, you're going to have a great life. How old were you when you figured out what it is that was really the best career for you? Uh, I think I was 65. <laughs> uh, I'm still working on it. I, I love what I get to do every day. This is a good example, you know, working with you and the faculty here at AUV it's a great opportunity for me to grow and gain new skills and make new friends and hopefully contribute in a real positive way to the things that are happening on our campus. I see. I was 30. Oh. Uh, I did many, many different jobs, uh, and I always did things that I loved and that things I didn't know how to do. So I would have a good time learning new skills, and that's how I developed my, my love of of just general business because I tried so many different things. And uh, if I really liked it a lot, I'd stay, keep doing it. And if I didn't, I, I'd find something else to do. And my, my parents always told me, why don't you just pick something? You know, you always, you, you, you're a quitter. Yep. And I, and I tried to explain that I'm not a quitter. This is a buffet for me. I'm trying everything to see what I like, what I'm good at and what likes me. Yeah, it's interesting you said that because I've heard that uh, from my own family. You, you, you're, why don't you pick something? And it's like I picked a lot of things. Um, in one company I worked in, I think um, the HR department knew me extremely well because they had an internal job posting s system, and I applied for lots of different jobs. And I was very fortunate. They gave me lots of opportunities. I tried lots of different things. But I also knew that I like change and I'm okay with taking a risk. And, and I've failed enough to know that, you know, you get knocked down, it hurts, it's not pleasant. But in, if you pick yourself up and you, you, you know, you keep going forward, generally um, God's going to keep an eye on all of us and I'll be fine. Let me ask your opinion. I'm going to make a statement, and you tell me if it, you think it's true or not. <clears throat> I think that there are there are two ways to to find the right career path for you. One is to pick something that you that you really want to do and you're committed to. If you're going to be a doctor uh, and certain other professions, if you're going to be a nuclear scientist, then you have to start early. Yep. Right. And, and so that's a commitment that you make early and. And probably half the people that do that are really glad they did. And the other half, by the time they have time to figure out if they're happy or not, it's too late. They're doing right. it. And they don't, have, they don't have another choice. Right. And the other half of people are like me, where I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I, wanted, but I did know how well I wanted to do it. 
Okay. So I just knew that whatever it was I chose to do, I wanted to be the best at it, or at least the best that I could be at mm-hmm. it. So I, I, I sought skill training in university. I wanted to learn. I wanted to discover what is it that everybody has in common, and what could I get good at that would help empower me in any career decision or any social situation. And I became a speech major. Okay. I, it was the, you know, I tried five different majors. I was, a, I was a senior before I declared what my majors were in university. They, they kept bugging me every year and I really didn't know until I was yep. a senior, I'm going to be a speech communications major. Why? Because communication was the only thing that I found that people had in common was the ability to communicate. And the better they were at it, the better results they got in whatever they were doing or whoever they were with. Absolutely. And, and, yeah. and so I fine-tuned my two skills. One is my communication skills, and the other was learning how to learn. Those are the two things, and, and learning how to fail. <laughs> Those are the three things, because learning how to fail is not learning how to get bad at something. It's learning how to recover from failure, get up and do it again, and then succeed, or keep doing it until you either get it done or you realize you don't need to do it. Right. So right. I, I was really looking for a life skill training that was portable, and that's why I became a chiropractor ultimately because it was a it was a body of knowledge that I could take with me wherever I went. I all I needed was my head, my heart, and my hands. Sure, yeah, and yeah. it worked out well. Yeah. I've I've been a chiropractor and a and a teacher in five countries. Yep. Yeah. Well, in, there you go. In my seventy years, and every one of them was a new experience where I started off knowing only half of what I needed to know. Right. And I did the same thing in my in my careers that I did in school and my early jobs. I took jobs that I could learn and that I could benefit from, from succeeding in. And then I either moved on or I built upon it or I stayed with it and got better at it and, sure. and kept it as yeah. a life practice. Why not? So, uh, Michael, would you like to leave us with any um, uh, suggestions or any words of wisdom for our listeners today? Well, I'd, I'd say our conversation today has been really insightful, and I would encourage anyone who's got a question about their career path or their career journey or how to pick a career, that it's not really that complicated. Um, and one of the best things you can do in your life is to build a close circle of friends who you trust and admire and hopefully have people around you that support you in whatever vision you have for yourself going forward and rely on those people and use them to help you get where you want to go by just being a good human being. Very good. Thank you so much. And that's it for our show today, everyone. Thanks for 